Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to our Ask the Expert event today. We're going to be learning about birds with expert Mark Faraday. I'm GBH News reporter Craig Lamold, and I'm the host for this afternoon's event. Thanks to everybody who's joining us today. We've got a big group of people excited to learn about birds. Uh, I especially want to thank our leadership circle and our Ralph Lowell Society members. We really appreciate your continued generous support. Before we get started, I want to just give a friendly reminder. Unlike us, you're not going to be on video. We won't be able to hear or see you, but we do want to know your questions. If you have a question you want answered, uh, just put in the open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type it in. Uh, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from, so please let us know uh, where you're watching today's event from. And um, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer uh, to, uh, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. This is really important because those go to the top of our Q&A tab, and we're really going to make sure to get to the ones that most people want to hear the answers to. Um, if you want to have our closed captioning feature today, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. You're going to get two options that pop up. Uh, we suggest you choose subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also do full transcript and you're going to get a sidebar open up where you can see what each speaker is saying. Um, please bear in mind the captions may be slightly delayed. Um, but without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Faraday. Um, Mark has been the science coordinator at Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary since August of 2007. He's led birding trips for Mass Audubon since 2002. Uh, he studied bird ecology for the last 20 years, working on research projects in Kenya and Florida, Texas, Arizona, Mexico, all, all over the world. And his weekly essay on Cape and Islands bird life, The Weekly Bird Report, airs each Wednesday on CAI, the Cape and Islands NPR station. He also co-hosts Bird News, a monthly call-in show about birds on CAI's uh, The Point with Mindy, Mindy Todd. And uh, that's a lot he does all about birds, and I'm so excited that it brings him here to join us today. Mark, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Hey, Craig. Uh, good to see you, and happy to do it. I love doing these. I love Let's doing do it. it, too. Yeah. I love doing it, too. I have always tons of questions about birds for you, and these are always a lot of fun, so thanks for being here. Just to start off with, I know it's been an exciting time for birders especially on the Cape, right? Uh, you know, you've been talking about this on the weekly bird report. What's going on right now? It's, it's, give us the, the summary of, of what's been happening right now. I think it's always an exciting time for birders. Always. But well, especially we walk, recently, right? We walk out the door and we're just surrounded by old friends all the time. There's birds everywhere. Yes, no, you're right. It, this, is a, this is a particularly good time, especially where I am out on the Cape, the outer Cape. Um, this, is a, this is the time of migration. Um, breeding birds are finishing up pretty much all of the breeding birds are done, maybe with the exception of goldfinches that might still have chicks. They probably still have chicks now, but most other things have fledged all of their chicks and they're thinking about moving somewhere. Um, and right now, especially here on the Cape, things are coming at us from all directions. We have terns that you know, bred in Long Island, an island in Long Island Sound are coming north to Cape Cod to stage for a while before they eventually head to South America. Um, we have birds from further north, warblers and things like that, that breed in the, the great northern forests of Canada have been moving in some cases since mid-July and they're coming through. So you can see songbird migrants. Seabirds have come here from all points on the globe. And this is a time of year where you might want to get out on a whale watch, whether it's out of Boston or Plymouth or Town, whatever, Gloucester, um, get out on a whale watch and you'll see these birds that you might not pay attention to. I, most people probably don't pay attention to the birds on a whale watch, right? You know, you're the, the, those magnificent leviathans are sort of holding everybody's attention, the humpback whales, their lunch feeding and all that. But look at the birds. Yeah, you're because not even they, looking at the whales. You're looking up in the in the air. Flying oh, around. you know, I, I, the whales are pretty amazing, too. And I certainly give them their due. But, <laughs> but you know, I've seen them. But <laughs> these birds that are out there as well have amazing stories to tell. In some cases, they're coming from down near Antarctica. And they're on their winter. They come up here for our summer to get away from their southern hemisphere winter. Things like Wilson Storm Petrel and Great Shearwaters. They're here by the thousands. Cory shearwaters came over from the Mediterranean. Uh, there was just, there was a, a shearwater that had never been identified in Massachusetts, only the second time in North America, was just east of Chatham. That came from the Cape Bird Islands off of West Africa. Um, and then uh, Manx shearwaters from the North. 
So they're coming from all points on the globe, really, to come here and feed in the rich waters around Massachusetts, the Gulf of Maine. And so that's just, it's one thing to look for. If, you, if you're out on a boat, you're, you're fishing, or you're on a whale watch, look at these birds, figure out what they are, and learn their stories, which they're incredible. And then shorebirds. So everybody's going to the beaches this time of year. And this is the best time in New England to see migratory shorebirds. And these are birds, they don't breed here for the most part. They breed mostly in Arctic and subarctic regions where the trees sort of start petering out and you get in above the tree line and into the tundra, coastal tundra in particular, places like Alaska and, and uh, Northern Canada. So that's where all of these shorebirds are, are coming from. And this is the time to see them, things like semi-palmated sandpipers. So there's this little gray sandpiper running around on a mud flat right now. You're taking a walk in a salt marsh or you're, you're weak on the cape or whatever. That bird has an amazing story. They're declining, people are worried about them, but it's, mm. it's stopping off on its way between the North Slope of Alaska and Brazil. That little bird, this, you know, they're like this big. And it's running around, it's feeding on invertebrates, it needs, needs places to feed and rest, places like Mass Audubon's Wealth Wheat Bay Sanctuary, where I am right now. Um, that's one of our big goals, is providing places for these birds to feed and rest. And just think about that little bird having to then launch from here and, and then fly maybe nonstop to the coast of Brazil from Like, like from how do they even do that? How does something so small travel such a long, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. It is, it's, it's very mysterious to us. It's, it's what they do, it's the business they're in. <laughs> they know how to do it. They're physiologically adapted to it in ways that it's hard for us to get our head around. Um, you know, their muscles, they can just flap continuously for days at a time. Um, they have to be able to battle, you know, this is hurricane season, and this is true of other little birds, songbirds that, that do the same thing. Black pole warblers will be coming through soon. Same story. They might be coming from a, a coastal forest in Alaska, crossing the continent, feeding here in, in New England, and then, you know, this bird is the weight of a few nickels or something. It's, you know, it's this big. Um, and then it's doing the same thing. It's going to fly nonstop to Brazil, potentially, from here. It's hard to get your head around. It, it's incredible, and it's it's happening all around us right now. If you just if you know how to look and you take the time to appreciate the stories of of the birds and what what they're doing right now. Are they gearing up for this? I mean, like it, it must take a lot of pressuration to get ready for a big trip like that. Are they, are they eating like crazy? Like, what are they doing to get ready? Question. Yes, they're eating like crazy. And because scientists, we like to have words that other people don't understand that make us feel smart. And so they call it hyperphagy. It just means you're eating a lot. Eating. You know, think of people around the holiday. We're all in hyperphagy around the holiday. So birds are like that right now. Uh, they're just, some of them are doubling their weight. They're just, they're putting on fat. Fat is really important to migratory birds. And we run a bird banding station here that is going to start September 1st, where we have these very fine mist nets and we're monitoring how migratory songbirds are using the property. Um, are they staying? Are they gaining weight? Are we providing good habitat for them? What parts of the sanctuary are they using as they migrate between, you know, say the boreal forests of Canada and maybe South or Central America? And one thing we look at is how much fat they have on. Them. Mm -hmm. And there's like a scale that you record in the data for how much fat. It sounds a little bit invasive. Like, you probably wouldn't want somebody to catch you in a net and then poke at you and evaluate your fat content. <laughs> it sounds like a not sounds like a, a really bad doctor visit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah oh, especially after the pandemic yeah. when we all put on a few. Oh, Craig, you've got a lot of fat. You're ready to migrate. Uh, <clears throat> but but it's good if you're a bird. It's great, and okay. so um, and they use this fat because fat has a lot of energy in it compared to other sources of fuel. Um, and so they they live off of this fat as they're doing things like flying nonstop from New yeah. Orleans. Brazil. So yeah, their job is to eat and, and rest when they can at this time of year, because those things are a matter of life and death if you're a migratory bird. You know, you talked about all the exciting things that are going on right now. Wasn't there also like a, a sighting of a, a really rare kite, I think, that you were talking about in the bird? Yeah. Kite? So if you've spent time in South Florida, uh, maybe you've seen a bird called a swallow-tailed kite. Mm -hmm. Or the or the swamps of Georgia, even um, like coastal South Carolina, they get they get that far north, or Central America. There's 
what I consider the world's most graceful raptor, bird of play, prey, and it's called the swallowtail kite. And um, they're pretty big, and, you know, think of a red, a red-tailed hawk, but with like very pointy swallow-like wings and a very long forked swallow-like tail. Yeah. And they use that tail, they can twist it essentially 90 degrees as they're flying. They're just incredibly graceful. They're incredibly good at maneuvering very quickly in the air. They can pick dragonflies out of the air and then just chomp on them. Um, but they also pick a lot of things off of the trees, snakes and lizards and chipmunks and birds. They pick right out of nests. They swoop down and just grab them right out of nests. But they're incredible raptors, but they're very tropical. The center of their distribution is South America. The, most of the swallowtail kites in the world at any given time are in South America, especially in the winter. Mm -hmm. So then somebody reported on Facebook, oh, I've been seeing one pretty regularly in my yard on the, just in the upper, cape, upper Cape, an undisclosed location on the Upper Cape. Did and you think like, hmm. this can't be right? Well, we, no, I knew it was right, but it just intrigued me that it was this time, seeing it regularly was the unusual part. Yeah. Because they pass through and then you don't see them again. We do right. get them. And it's very, very small number. But she said, oh, yeah, we've been seeing it a lot. And then I had her contact me. She sends me a picture of it perched in a dead tree in the back of her yard. Like, wow. And then the next day she says, oh, it dive bombed my husband, which is something that raptors do when they're protecting a nest. Huh. Like, come on. I was like, are there two? She's like, no, no, no. Next day, she says, there are two. She sends me a picture of them copulate. <clears throat> they're mating. <laughs> they're copulating, doing the deed. I don't know if I have to explain this to the listeners, the birds and the bees. They, they probably know. I, I think they probably have some idea. Yes. These are people of the world. Uh, and so they're doing that. It, and nobody has ever documented any breeding behavior of this species north of southern North Carolina. Right. This is the Cape. And so this was a huge d discovery. I mean, it's yeah. just bizarre. Um, and, and so I had I sent somebody out. He was looking around for a nest. I don't have time to do anything fun. <laughs> It's small kids, a job, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, they, they didn't find a nest, but but these birds were around. And so this was the first documented breeding behavior for this species north of uh, North Carolina. And even North Carolina didn't get a record until 2013. Is there a Just, climate angle to this? I mean, like, it's we're warming here, right? Are we seeing so. different birds yeah. than we used to because of that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And certainly in the marine environment as well, fish, everything in the marine environment is moving north as the Gulf of Maine warms. Bird, yeah. bir birds have been moving north. Um, different species like Carolina wrens weren't around so much when I was a kid growing up in Brockton. And now they're everywhere. Now they're up to northern Vermont at least. And so a lot of these southern birds, these resident southern birds that don't migrate south for the winter have been taking advantage of are warmer on average winters have been moving north. Red-bellied woodpecker, many years ago, cardinals, titmice, mockingbirds. Um, they weren't New England birds 100, 150 years ago. So yes, yeah. in this case, I don't, I don't think so. Um, they, there is some post-breeding wandering of swallowtail kites. I talked to a friend of mine who's a um, swallowtail kite researcher, among other things, and put satellite transmitters on them and knows everything that they do. And it's pretty normal for them to wander north. And so I think these were young birds. I don't think they had a real nest. And they're probably gone by now because swallowtail kites migrate, their peak migration through South Florida is now. Like that's how wimpy they are. It's like not even September yet. They're like, we gotta go to South America. It's gonna get chilly around here, in, you know, Miami. <laughs> uh, and so I, I expect those birds are gone, but this was absolutely bizarre. Yeah. Like, to totally unexpected. For those of us in the in the birding community, it's just very cool and just an example of why birding is is can be so addictive. You just never know. I mean, bizarre yeah. occurrences are just around the corner if you, if you put the time in. You know, for for this you serious birders, it's these <clears throat> truly rare birds that are exciting. I, I think for the rest of us, very more casual birders, uh, a much more ordinary sighting could be thrilling. I was walking down my street here uh, earlier this week, and I saw a hummingbird in my neighbor's garden. And to me, like, I never see hummingbirds. Like, I, I almost never see them. So to actually see one just out and about was 
frankly, I was like way more excited than I should have been seeing this hummingbird. And, and that actually brings me to uh, the first question from, from the audience that I want to bring, uh, because we have a question about hummingbirds here. Um, and uh, this is from Sharon, who says, uh, my resident female hummingbird loves my, and I'm going to mispronounce this, this plant, a, a, a gas thatch? A ga I, I, I call it agastache. I've heard people pronounce it other ways. It's all right, I'm gonna go with that one. My resident female loves my yeah. Agastache plant and visits several times a day. How long do hummingbirds stay in New England and where do they migrate to? Yeah, good question. And yeah, Agastache or Agastache, I've heard people pronounce it. It's a, it's a really good pollinator plant. It's native to the Midwest, not so much to New England, but all the nurseries sell it. If you're doing any kind of pollinator gardening or landscaping or shopping for plants, um, get, Agastache paniculum. Um, it's usually a hybrid like Blue Fortune or Black Adder. They're really good. They bloom like getting off track here, but it's a really good plant. They bloom like um, July, early July to frost, which is incredible for a perennial. And bees love them, butterflies love them. She, um, she might have one of the uh, annual types that has kind of more pinky flowers that are really good for hummingbirds. Anyway. Throated hummingbirds are mostly gone by the mid-September, last week in September. Okay. I have multiple records of them still being in my yard on the Cape um, the first week in October. That seems to be a little bit more common now. Um, but they leave. If you see a hummingbird in Massachusetts after like mid-October, it's almost always a rare species from the West, hmm. like a, typically a rufous hummingbird which breed out in the out in the Rockies and in the Pacific Northwest, or maybe something else even more rare. We do get rare hummingbirds, particularly on the Cape, later in the season. But our our one species of breeding hummingbird, the ruby-throated hummingbird, are mostly gone. Like if you're in the North Shore, like interior of Massachusetts, yours are probably gone by mid-September. Where do they go? They go to Central America. So they go. They go to like Costa Rica or, you know, Southern Mexico, Belize or something like that. Wow. Seems like a good idea. Why do I never see them? Like I was, I was so excited to see one the other day. Like, you know, so many other birds you just see more regularly. I guess like I don't have a feeder. It seems like having a hummingbird feeder is, is a pain. You got to keep changing the liquid all the time. And I've never had a feeder yeah, before. Yeah. I don't know. It can be a pain. You're right. So I encourage people to plant things that they like, like, yeah. Native honeysuckle vine, Lonicera semperviorans, is, is one you can get at nurseries. Um, I have that. that. That's a really good one for them. Uh, the red bee bomb, you know, the scarlet bee bomb, they like a lot. Uh, there are other things too. But yeah, if you don't have the right flowers or a feeder, you're not, and you're not a birder, you're not likely to notice hummingbirds because they're just going to zip by and you're going to think it's a bee or something or a dragonfly. You're, you're just not going to notice them. But if you have the things that get their attention like the right flowers and you know if you don't if you're in the city and you don't basically you can only do pots and things like that yeah there are some really good plants the annuals that you can get and put in a pot that will bring in hummingbirds like uh cupfia fire, firecracker plant or something like that black and blue salvia like those are bulletproof like you hang those up somewhere <clears throat> and you'll you'll probably get a hummingbird at, at some point as they're passing through Awesome. Okay. And there's nothing cooler than a hummingbird. I mean, yeah, what, what is cool? They're just, they're so amazing. If, if you get a chance to watch them and just how fast they are, yeah. like we don't, we're, like we're basically a statue to them, even when they're moving it, when we're moving, you know, they're just like, you know, they'll come up and they'll poke around in your ear or something like that. They're like, what is this thing? And then the, you watch them take off and it just seems like they go a thousand miles an hour and they'll go, 300 yards in the blink of an eye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're, they're just, incredible. they're just incredible. We have a, a question here from Suzanne who asks, uh, are there fewer screech and great horned owls in Massachusetts South coast area this summer? Uh, used to, they used to be heard frequently, but not so much this year. Um, I don't think so. It, nobody keeps track of that kind of thing on, a, on an annual basis. Really. It, it would be hard to say with any certainty whether one common bird or another is less common in some certain place this year. It's just, just that kind of data doesn't exist. Usually it's it's just somebody's personal experience, something being different, you know, where they hang out. I, you know, 
I've had a screech owl multiple times this week, calling as early as 7.30 while it's still very light out um, mm. in my neighborhood. I've had great horns. We have great horns here on the sanctuary that have a couple of young ones that I hear. Um, so, you know, and I'm, I'm out in Harwich. So not that I know of, both of those species are very, very common, very, very, very common. And they do very well. I mean, screech owls are way more common than anybody realizes. They're in cemeteries in the city. They're, they're just, they're not too picky. They just need a few trees, one mm. with a hole in it. They'll use nest boxes, like big, you know, the big nest boxes, like the size uh, for wood ducks. People might be familiar with, you can get boxes and um, have screech owls. And screech owls are more common in the southeastern part of the state than they are in other parts of the state. The further north you go, they, they start to blink out. And the further west you go, they become, they become less common. But great horns are pretty much everywhere. You know, you mentioned the boxes. I was just thinking of, I, I, I built a little birdhouse that I was pretty excited about. I thought, it, I thought I did a pretty nice job, but the birds didn't agree because nobody has moved in and yeah. I, they, nobody moved in last year. And I was like, okay, I put it up too late. They'd already nested. So it was up throughout the whole year. And I thought in the spring, like we're definitely going to get birds in this box, uh, in, in this birdhouse nothing nobody no one ever moved in and i don't know if they don't like my carpentry or what's going on i think maybe did i put it like too high up it was fairly it was probably eight feet high in a tree is is you know any any idea or is it just you know sometime? well what do you have around like what were you hoping to get in there I don't, i'm not sure what's around your your neighborhood like was it a i would have taken any box you know it was i mean i, I think it, it depends on how big the hole is right like i mean i would say it was probably yeah like, that big of a hole the least picky thing that you can buy any of the like silly little decorative birdhouses at your local garden center or whatever, the kind that I would never buy, house wrens will nest in. Yeah, I would have taken that. Even house if you, you could put it, you could hang it from something, you could put it right next to your busiest door that you use all the time, and house wrens will use it. They're little, they can fit inside the little silly boxes. The best box overall would be like a bluebird size box. Mm. If you just like Google, whatever. Is that what you made? Did you follow like a bluebird? I think design? I would have like probably like a, a wren. You know, I just assumed a wren would move in, but then I didn't even do that. So maybe. Right. I'm but the, the bluebird, you, you wouldn't have gotten bluebirds necessarily, but other things do use them like titmice and, and yeah. chickadees and uh, sometimes nuthatches. Um, yeah. So if you have those around, you might just have to be patient or you could try it and try it in a different location. Hanging them on trees um, increases the risk of predation by things like raccoons. I had, I have one on a tree that my tip mice used this year in my yard and the, a raccoon, this is kind of grim, but a raccoon got in there and just ripped out all the nestlings and wow. ate, ate them presumably. The best situation to reduce predation if you're uh, putting up nest boxes is to have it on a metal post with a stove pipe baffle it's called, which is a type of predator guard yeah. that keeps the raccoons from getting up there and it, raccoons are the big ones um, and, okay. and getting at the eggs and chicks. But, you know, you can try it on a tree as well it, um, and just see if you get anything. Okay, maybe next year, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we have a que question from Chris from Brookline who says, we had what looked like a fledging, uh, fledgling downy woodpecker in our hummingbird feeder. Is this normal behavior for a downy? It, it doesn't seem to be phased by us coming to the feeder. Uh, is that normal for a, a, a downy to, to go to a hummingbird feeder? Uh, it does happen. A lot of people report that, like different things like chickadees and woodpeckers uh, going to hummingbird feeders. We're not sure if they're, you know, like jonesing for some sugar or if it's just like visiting birds, like they need the water. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then sometimes they'll collect water in the top or they'll have a moat uh, on purpose in the feeder to, to deter ants and the birds will get on the hummingbird feeder to drink that. I've had, I've had butterflies on my hummingbird feeder before. So, <laughs> so lots of different things we'll, we'll try to use them, certainly like, you know, yellow jackets and things too. But yes, a lot of people have reported woodpeckers in particular visiting hummingbird feeders. So it is, it is a thing. All right, cool. Um, we got an, another uh, question. Uh, this one's great uh, from, I think Noni says, I'd like to ask about tongues of birds. For the first time, I noticed my little downy woodpeckers head bobbing erratically over the feeder and a long tongue slurping up each sunflower seed at uh, lightning speed. Which birds use tongues and which use beaks? 
can you uh, put me can, can you put me more in the picture with tongues what a cool question and what a cool observation i don't yeah, think I've i ever... you really have to be watching very carefully to yes. see not only that your bird is is feeding but how it's doing it you know what what supervision you know does yeah. this person have they're like superman like i don't i've never noticed that but yes so woodpeckers are the best example of birds that use their tongues and they're just far and away they are um they, they have like super tongues and so their whole skull is adapted to to you know it's like the the retractable cord on a vacuum cleaner <laughs> you know, like you pull it out it's on a thing like a spring-loaded thing you pull it out and then it gets sucked back in that's yeah. kind of like their tongue it's like wrapped around the skull and then it sticks out it's got barbs on it you have to be careful when you're um using mist nets because they can get the bar they can get their tongues caught in the net sometimes because it's got mm. these barbs on it like a fish hook and that helps them kind of um i think getting small insect larvae things out of holes and trees and so yeah they're using that tongue to extract um insects and insect larvae from from the holes they're making in in trees hummingbirds and woodpeckers are the the tongue birds and so hummingbirds use their tongues that's you know they're not like <laughs> yeah in their tongues like a dog they gotta you get know, into the tree yes. right to... and, and people well hummingbirds are getting into the flower yes yeah. so hummingbirds are the the tongue is going down into whatever the nectar is on whatever flower and um Columbine, wild columbine, that was the other really good hummingbird plant uh, okay. I meant to mention, the nice native plant, um, wild columbine or red columbine. It's adapted, it evolved with hummingbirds to be hummingbird pollinated. So the nectar is in a place where as the hummingbird is accessing it, it's getting pollen on its forehead. And then it next, next flower it goes to, it's transferring that pollen from its forehead to the ovary. Um, so yeah, they're using their tongues and people have gotten into like slow motion photography to, to look at exactly the physics of how it's happening. And I can't remember the specifics, but, uh, but it's, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> and there was new research recently that showed that they don't, in terms of like the shock absorption of banging their heads into the trees, right. That, that they don't, it doesn't work the way I think they, everybody assumed it was. Right. And so some physicists got involved in that, that long, uh, long-standing debate. I'm sure all of you have had this discussion at a cocktail party, like, why don't woodpeckers get headaches? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're all talking about it, but nobody has any answer. Um, and so uh, I think it was a physicist who sort of got into this and started doing these, you know, back of the envelope calculations. And they actually published the results and they determined that they don't have a shock absorption yeah. system in their skulls. Um, the reason that they're not getting traumatic brain injury, so it, it, the size of people at our size and the size of our brain and our skull, if we did what woodpeckers did, we would have chronic brain injuries in two seconds or, or, or traumatic brain injuries in two seconds, but woodpeckers don't. And he, they worked out that it was, this, it was just a, a question of scale. Mm -hmm. Like because of how small they are and the forces involved, it somehow just wasn't enough to give them concussions every time they're s slamming their heads the way they do. And I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has tried to, um, you, you know, prove or disprove that, but it, it seemed plausible to me because right. nobody has identified a real shock absorption system or, you know, that was kind of assumed to be the case in the past. But, but it is bizarre. I mean, they should really be, <laughs> they should really uh, be getting concussions all the time yeah. just based on what they do. Seems and one, like of, one of the things I loved about that is that it highlights how much we're still learning, right? Like all we, there was these assumptions all this time, like, oh, they must have like some sort of, but like, no, we're, we're, we're learning a lot about birds still yeah. and, and we'll continue to. Oh, absolutely. The most common backyard birds are still like big mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. We have a question from Catherine who says, why do hawks screech? We've had a family in our yard recently. One of them has screeched incessantly. Yeah. Hawks screech, but screech owls don't. Discuss. Uh, those are young hawks. And young hawks, like young people, can be kind of annoying. You know, they're just like, you know, they're needy, they're noisy. <laughs> um, and that's typically, and we get calls about that kind of thing because they'll just, they'll sit in one place and they'll just call. And that's usually a bird that has fledged from the nest. 
and its parents don't want to feed it anymore, but it still wants to be fed, right? It's like that post-college period. It, you know, the, <laughs> the hawk is trying to move back in after college and the parents are like, no, you got to find your own food. Yeah. And, but but the, the young hawks are particularly noisy at that time. And especially if they're making something that sounds screechy, that's another indication that it's a young one. And young great horned owls also make a screechy sound that you're more likely to hear towards dusk. If you live in, you know, if you have some nice woods around and you have great horned owls, you can listen for this. And it's the only sound that young great horned owls can make for their whole first year. Um, and they're And they're noisy too. They're also asking to be fed long after the adults want to feed them anymore. So that, I think that's what's happening. Hmm. All right. Uh, important question um, from Joe, which is, is the drought affecting birds? Yeah, no, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, it has to be. Um, it's hard to know in the moment. You know, they're probably producing fewer young. Um, Others, I think, are able to compensate as long as they can find a, a source of insects for their young ones. And young birds don't need water. They just need enough insects. and They get all the water they need from the food they eat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so um, to the extent that water sources that pr produce the insects that they need are drying up and that insect populations are being affected by the drought, that would affect birds by affecting their ability to get enough insects to feed their young, and maybe they wouldn't um, produce as many chicks. You could also get, you might get heat related issues where more chicks are dying in, in nests and cavities and things like that. I suspect that's happening as well. But it's hard to say with, in any definitive way, like, yes, it's the drought and we see that and it's happening right now because of this, this, and this. We sort of assume that it's happening and those are the various ways that it can be affecting. Okay. Okay. Well, so many great questions. And I just want to uh, encourage people to, if you have more questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat and then also, or the Q and A rather. Um, and then also uh, if you see questions that you want answers to, please give them up books. Cause um, we'll, we'll see those ones at the top. We have a question from Yasmin. I love this question. Yasmin wants to know, is it possible to volunteer out in the field with you? especially if uh, they have previous ba bird banding experience. And I'll broaden that a little bit if I could to say, are there other sort of citizen science opportunities that you know of as well? Yes. Um, yeah, certainly we have a lot of opportunities. Here at Mass Audubon Wellfleet Bay, um, they mostly revolve around turtles and horseshoe crabs and um, bird banding. We do have volunteers for our bird banding. Um, if you can commit to, you know, being here a couple few days a week and really putting in the time, it's, that's fairly intensive, but we absolutely accept volunteers for our bird banding. And, um, and there's another bird bander here on the Cape who accepts volunteers on Wing Island in Brewster. Sue Finnegan, I don't know where, where was Yasmin? Uh, I don't think Yasmin said where they were, but I, I, I assume nearby if, uh, if they're interested in, in, uh, Oh yeah, they they said me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then we we have piping clover volunteers. We monitor nests of um, nesting shorebirds here on our beaches, mainly piping clovers and American oyster catchers. We do that on the Outer Cape, say, mid April through now. Really, uh, we we look for volunteers for that as well. So sure, get in touch. All right. There's, there's a, I think, a message for everybody out there. And, uh, you know, if, if not working directly with Mark, I'm sure there's lots of opportunities. People are joining us from, I think, all over the country. And, and uh, you know, Audubon societies around the country uh, do look for volunteers to do that kind of work, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, lot, lots of organizations use volunteers for that sort of thing. So okay. um, it's just a matter of connecting with them locally, wherever you are. Martha wants to know where have the Baltimore Orioles migrated to uh, and when did they leave the South Shore? They left around noon uh, three days ago. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're still around. You'll be able to see Baltimore Orioles through October, especially near the coast, because they, they're continuing to migrate through from points north. Your local ones might have left shortly after the chicks fledged and moved somewhere either nearby or, or further away, they start, they start moving as soon as the chicks fledge. 
And it's a little bit mysterious where they go and how far. Um, it might just be a few neighborhoods over or uh, it might be further than that. I know people who now are seeing six, seven Orioles at a time still at their Oriole feeder here in Wellfleet. Other people have that experience where all of a sudden they're not seeing them anymore. Hmm. And, and then here on the Cape, increasingly Baltimore Orioles are, are findable in the winter, like the middle of winter. And they're, they're supposed to, <laughs> they don't all get the, the memo, I guess, but they're supposed to all migrate out and spend the winter in Central America. Yeah. And they love, they love the winter in orange groves, in particular Central American countries. But um, here, especially on the Outer Cape, it's not that hard if you're a, a serious birder and you spend a lot of time in the field and you're out there beating the bushes, you'll come across Orioles in December, January, February. And I've known people who Someone in Dennis has like six of them coming to their feeders all winter long. And so that's kind of a strange thing. So gone, you know, when are they gone? There's not like a time when they're all gone. Some of them migrate out now. Some of them migrate out in September. Others will be coming through, you know, really through October. So you still have a chance to see them. There's, I heard one singing today just here at Wellfleet Bay. Great. All right. Uh, so many fantastic questions from the audience. Thank you so much, and please keep them coming. Just want to take a quick moment to introduce my colleague, Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Jamie, you there? All right, we'll give Jamie a moment. We'll ask one more question, then we'll go back to Jamie. A uh, question from Tom wants to know, how do migrating birds recognize backyard or deck feeders as a source of food, given they've not been in a particular area and learned that feeder is a source of food? And my feeder, I should say, comes and goes. Like sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Hey, Jamie, I think they watch the other bird. Birds are always watching each other. And your local, the birds that don't migrate, like chickadees and nuthatches and woodpeckers and things, you know, they're hip to the scene. They know what bird feeders are. They know where they are. A lot of you, I'm sure, have had this experience where your feeders have been empty for six months. And 30 seconds after you put some seed in, there's a chickadee waiting. So they're watching, you know, their life depends on knowing where the food sources are at a moment's notice and, and just being ever vigilant. And then even for a bird that has never seen a bird feeder before, they know how to watch other birds that are finding a food source. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's as simple as that. Okay, great. Hey, Jamie. Hi, Craig. Sorry for that delay. Um, but I want to say hello to everybody joining us this afternoon and and thanks for joining us as we learn more about summer birds, a fascinating topic and their fascinating behavior. You know, I'm sure we all know this um, GBH is a nonprofit public media station and you can tell um, by the quality of what you see and hear on our radio and TV every day. You know, we're here to serve our audience, not advertisers. And our commercial free status means we rely on your support, that's audience support, to keep growing and going. So today, if you support GBH by giving $12.50 a month as a GBH sustaining member, we have a very special experience to offer. Mark Faherty, will take you out in the field, and I know we've had questions about that today. He will take you out in the field to search for birds of the marsh or sea. Guests can choose between two live walking tour options on Saturday, September 24th. The first tour will take place at Belle Isle Marsh Reservation in East Boston from 8 to 10 a.m. The second experience will take place at Winthrop Beach from 11.15 a.m. to 1.15 p.m. So as not to distract and disturb our feathered friends too much, each tour will be limited to 15 guests. So RSVP now and make sure to bring your birding binoculars on September 24th. Giving to GBH today is so simple. Just click on the link that my friends are sharing in the chat tab now to be brought to our donation page at gbh.org slash support events. The whole RSV process should take no longer than a few minutes of your time. Donors are the wind beneath our wings. 
Um, that's never been more true than now. And if you're already a member, thank you so much for your support. If you wish to become one today, just click on the donation link you see in our chat right now and make that donation to go in an ex on an exclusive birding experience with today's birding expert, Mark Faherty. Again, each tour is only open to 15 guests, so best to reserve your spot in the flock right now. Thanks in advance for your support and happy birding, everyone. And now back to our fabulous host, Craig. Thank you so much, Jamie. You know, Mark, we've had some pretty great premiums for pledging before, but the chance to go on a, a bird tour with you, I think maybe uh, maybe takes the keg. Yeah, this I, I'm looking forward to it. I haven't birded, you know, I don't get over the bridge that much. I'm, you know, one of these Cape Codders who, you know, ooh, the, over the bridge is scary. Uh, the big city, but Belle Isle Marsh, I mean, this is, so many people in Boston don't even know it's there. It's it's a DCR property that this um, the agency that runs the state parks and Winthrop Beach too. I mean, there are these hidden gems within the city. Uh, you know, it's sort of like a mini Cape Cod. It's it's salt marshes. It's migrating shorebirds. It's herons and egrets by the dozens. And, um, if you catch it right, um, and then Winthrop Beach, you know, shorebird migrating shorebirds like we've been talking about. It ducks turns and things like that nice. and so you know and these are like accessible by public transportation and they're just right there in the city and i'm looking i haven't been out there in a long time and i'm looking forward to you checking them out i think it'll be fun that'll be great and again you can you can join mark by by making a donation to gbh now and, and thank you to everybody who supported us because it, it really helps us have events like this and makes these things have possible uh for your support so thank you um we have a question from, uh, I think it's uh, from Janelle from Lexington, uh, has a question about a, a bird that's not local, but that we can all watch. She says, uh, I watched the live bird cams through Cornell, a big shout out to their website. You can learn so much. And one cam is an albatross nest in New Zealand. Uh, after the nestlings fledge, we're told they won't touch land again for about four years. What does that actually mean? I know they're not flying all that time. Do they rest on top of the ocean? That must leave them vulnerable to sharks and other predators. Can can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Yeah. No, they really they don't they don't come back to land. It um, it takes them like a lot of big birds. It takes them several years to mature. You know, that's around here. That's things like herring gulls. I mean, herring gulls aren't mature for four years. Bald eagles aren't mature for five years. Mm -hmm. and that and albatrosses are among the world's biggest birds it, they're incredible in so many ways you know they sleep on the wing you know they're famous for that they have these really long narrow wings that they rarely have to flap they just sort of glide their way around the ocean for years so they Literally, do, do they really years fly at a time. though for four years they don't sit no. down at all anywhere not necessarily no they, they they can land on the water they have web feet they, they're, they're well adapted to be um on the ocean and they they will land on the water when they're feeding certainly <clears throat> um, you know, they feed on a lot of squid. Like so many things that live in the open ocean depend on squid in addition to bait fish for food, and, and they're no exception. And so, so they're diving for when, they, when they're okay. feeding, they're diving, and they're sitting on the water, just like imagine when you see gulls, you know, foraging. They're, they're like that. But it will fly for thousands of miles uh, without landing and, and, and barely flapping. I mean, they're truly incredible. They, they can... There are other seabirds that do this too. The shearwaters, like I talked about earlier, that we can see around here, long, narrow wings, and they are able to use the wind deflecting upwards off of the waves to get lift so they can fly without flapping. And this saves them so much energy when you have to range over thousands of square miles of trackless ocean yeah. using scent. They find very rare among birds to find food by smell. But albatrosses and other tube noses like shearwaters, they can, they detect the smell of zooplankton grazing on phytoplankton, which tells them it's a rich area where there will also be fish and squid. They can wow. smell that hundreds of miles away, navigate over what to us looks like featureless ocean and find food that way. And they can get there without barely, barely flapping at all, basically. It just they're just amazingly adapted to be out over the open ocean for most of their lives really that's amazing incredible yeah. 
<clears throat> we have a, just a, a ton of great questions here. So I'm going to attempt to get to as many of them as possible by doing a lightning round here, uh, Mark. So uh, I'm just going to fire off some questions and, and give me as, as quick as you can. Let's see if how many we can we can get to for, for the next few minutes, because we yeah. want to make sure we get uh, answer as many questions as we can. To, to start off, um, one question from uh, MM is, what is the best protocol when one finds an injured wild bird? I had this question myself. Yeah, and it depends on where you live. We're very lucky here on the Cape to have two really good wildlife rehabilitators, one in the Mid Cape and one in the Outer Cape. Uh, depending on where you live, there might not be one so close, but there's a website, I think Mass Wildlife maintains it, um, that will help you identify a wildlife rehabilitator near you. What the right thing to do is totally situational. You know, there's a different thing that you would do if it was a bird that was nestling that is naked and you want to get it back in the nest versus one that's injured that you want to get to a rehabilitator, you know, and so those rehabilitators can, can um, guide you through what the best thing is to do, whether bring it to them or just kind of let nature, oftentimes the answer is nothing. It's people kind of misunderstanding that a bird, a fledged bird just needs to be left alone and its parents are still tending it, like happens with robins a lot, even still right now. Yeah. There might be some recently fledged robins that look like they shouldn't be out of the nest, but they it's fine. They're being fed by the adults if you watch them long enough. Um, and so, so again, it, it's situational. But yeah, get familiar with the nearest. You know, there's one on the in Hingham, uh, the New England Wildlife Center, I think it's called. Uh, that's a good one for the Boston area. And then there are others as you go further west. Um, and there is a website, Clearinghouse, where you can identify the ones in Massachusetts near you. And, and Liz just put in the chat a, a, a Audubon, Mass Audubon uh, site on what to do if you find injured birds as well. Um, all right, lightning round here, Mark. We got to be a little quicker. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, this actually direct question from Elaine, should we be feeding the birds? Sure. There you go. That, see, oh, now I'm you not, really get the spirit of the lightning. I know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good at short answers, and so I'm trying to be better. There's no, there's really... Yeah everything is more complicated there's no reason not to right now there's no like you know there's um highly pathogenic avian influenza is going through water birds in the state and other places right now and poultry it's not really an issue with songbirds and bird feeders if you enjoy bird feeding and you don't have a rat problem or a bear problem or something like that situationally yes but it's not bad for the birds in any way to you know oh. it's not like they become if dependent you no, no, no. If you keep your feeders clean and, you know, you're really doing it for your own enjoyment, don't kid yourself that you're doing it for the birds. Like a lot of people do, you're doing it for you and it's totally fine. Just That's keep fine. the feeders clean and keep the okay. pests, pests at bay. All right. Elaine says there are about 50 swans in the Mashpee River uh, in the spring. Then they leave. Where do they go? I don't see their babies. Where would they nest? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and you, you do see big numbers of swans in um, particularly the southeastern part of the state in Peru, Rhode Island. Um, but then, yeah, they pair off and they'll just disappear into different backwaters to, to have a nest. I, I have no idea where those particular swans nest. They don't go very far. Um, and so they're, they're probably nesting not that far from that area. We don't really want them to be nesting. They're, they're an invasive introduced species. And they can have detrimental effects on the ecosystem and other species, but it's always a tough thing because people love them and they're like, oh, the swans, you know. And, yeah. and then I'm the biologist who's like, actually, they're not native. You're not supposed to like them. And I just so it's always, it's always controversial. And then state wildlife agencies are doing things like addling the eggs so they don't hatch uh, to protect native species, you know. So wow. See, I can't give short answers. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Don't let's, overthink let's, everything. Don't worry about it. But I, that is interesting, actually, that swans are seen as as something uh, negative. I mean, I've always, of course, like everybody else, enjoyed them and didn't realize that we we shouldn't be enjoying them. They're bad. bad. They're bad, Craig. No, you can continue to enjoy them. It's fine. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, Carol says my hummingbird feeder has four stations, but I see them. I think usually females brawling in midair over the feeder until one prevails and feeds solo. Why don't they share? Guess this, which species was this? Hummingbird. Share. Oh, <laughs> and I mean, you know, food is life or death for birds. So they don't mess around, you know, and, and hummingbirds are wicked pugnacious. It's hmm. so fun to watch them because they'll attack any other bird. 
it, you know, you watch them long enough and they're at some point they'll attack some puzzled, much larger bird that's like, what's going on? Why am I being attacked? The hummingbird just messing with it just because it can. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, they are territorial about food sometimes. I don't see a ton of that. I do see them chasing each other. Um, but there, usually there's enough to go around in my yard. I don't even have feeders out anymore. I have butterfly bushes, which are not native, but they came with my house and the, you know, the hummingbirds really like them. And that's mainly what they're using right now. And there's enough for them that they're not fighting so much. But if the dense, as the density goes up, as the number of hummingbirds trying to use your yard goes up, you're gonna see more fighting. Fight, fighting is what we biologists call density dependent. It won't be that much, it's just logic. You know, they're just, if there aren't that many, then there's enough to go around, they're not gonna fight, but as resources get scarce, they're gonna fight more. So put up more feeders, I guess. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, Helen from Newton asks, what sort of food uh, are good to provide during the migration season or is just standard black oil sunflower seeds okay? Yeah, that's fine. So the best food to provide during migration is plants native plants, landscape with native plants, right? So if you're, if you're developing a lot, keep as many of the native trees and shrubs as, as possible. Um, grasslands are great too. If you have a big property and you can, um, you can get seed mixes to plant a, a native grassland with a pollinator mix, uh, really good for birds. But it's about the native plants provide the insects that birds need to live. Birds don't need bird seed. There's plenty of seeds in the world in the form of plants. All the goldenrods as they go to seed, all the asters out there in the world, the seed, the grasses, you know, weeds, weedy lots. Ragweed is a really good source of food for seed eating birds. Hmm. Seed eating birds are not food limited. Insects is really what birds need. And this is a big movement now, and it's something that I do lectures about. Doug Tallamy is sort of the guru of this. He's a professor at University of Delaware professor of entomology who has these popular books about using native plants in your landscaping to provide food for insects, which then in turn feeds the birds because birds are feeding themselves and their babies insects for the most part. Hmm. Fruiting, sh fruiting shrubs are awesome. Plant some winterberry, plant some chokeberry, uh, plant some beech plums, you know, um, plant viburnums. And there are a number of great native trees and shrubs, the ones I just mentioned, and some others that you can plant that are great bird food summer through winter, viburnums in summer, things like yeah. winterberry and chokeberry in the winter, even crab apples that feeds birds in the winter. So think, think through plants, not bird feeders first. Yes, have bird feeders, but don't, don't think that that's like helping migratory birds, that's helping you see birds. Helping migratory birds is improving the habitat that gives them the insects they need. Yeah. And that means yeah. using native plants. Okay. You know, I feel like that's a super important message that we don't hear nearly enough. You know, that that it, it's about the plants and, and you should really focus on that. That's great. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here um, from Luca, who is 10 years old. Uh, he's in Watertown. He wants to know where is the best place to see bald eagles? Great question. Yeah, um, the Merrimack River in the winter up there in Newburyport uh, is a great place. The Quabbin Reservoir in Central Mass in, in winter. Winter's typically the best time to see them. There's the big reservoirs in Lakeville. If you're in Southeastern Mass, they bald eagles nest there. They're present year round. Um, the Connecticut River, you know, they've expanded so much. We now have them on the Cape. They're nesting on the Cape now, one or two places or maybe more that we don't know about. And we have them here year round. That wasn't the case 25 years ago, even, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and so they're exploding everywhere. And it's, it's to the point where you could see a bald eagle theoretically just about anywhere at any time of year in, in Massachusetts. But those places in the winter offers you a chance to see several bald eagles. Where I am, there's a pond called Long Pond in Harwich, where as many as six or seven bald eagles will use that all winter long. Any pond that has a herring run, uh, meaning that river herring are coming up from the ocean in the spring and coming into that pond to, to breed, 
that's a really rich pond that would be likely to have bald eagles. Uh, and so if you know of any herring run ponds near you, uh, they're always, always a good place to check for eagles, really any time of year now. Okay, great. Uh, Tim says, I get tons of sparrows in my feeders in Somerville, but relatively few other species. Is there a way to select for different species besides hummingbirds, uh, e.g. chickadees, jays, finches, nuthatches, woodpeckers, etc.? Yeah, you probably mean, you're in the city, you probably mean house sparrows. That tends to be like, yeah, like in the city, people get the, the kind of the supermarket mix, bird seed, which is mostly millet. And then they'll hang it out in a feeder. And because of where you are, you'll you'll mainly end up getting house sparrows. Yes, that's what I got. If yeah. you if you get uh, just regular like black oil sunflower seed, they don't seem to like that as much, and that tends to favor the the native things more, um, chickadees and such, depending on what you have around. So I would start there. And providing a water source is always a great idea wherever you are. If you can have a, just some kind of a bird bath. I mean, I try to do that year round. It's more important than food, really, uh, certainly at certain times of year, um, because they can usually find other food sources in terms of seeds and insects and things. But, um, you know, water and water also brings in things that will not come to your seed feeder, like warblers and tanagers and things, potentially. Not all the time, but it gives you that chance, especially if there's cover around your bird bath. Um, there's a good chance that you'll get something interesting some sort of colorful migratory species that you wouldn't get that would not come to your, you know, bird feeder. Yeah. You know, on, on the bird baths you mentioned, uh, that being a great idea, we have a question about that from Carol who says, I have chickadees, titmouse, and gold, uh, tit, I guess what, titmice, is that the plural of titmouse? Yeah, I uh, guess, yeah. <laughs> uh, goldfinches drinking from the ant cup in our hummingbird feeder, even though we have four bird paths in the yard, perhaps they feel safer com than uh, competing with the larger birds. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mentioned that earlier that they'll they have those moats on them and birds will yeah. drink them. I don't know. Maybe they like the fact that the you know it's sort of like food and drink. <laughs> there's one stop on the shopping. Ant, yeah, there's drowned ants in there they can eat too. In, in addition to getting a good drinks. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, yeah, I think they'll take any any water source they come across. Okay. Tony wants to know, is there bird flu going around? I, she says, I've found uh, Ted, dead house sparrows and morning doves. My neighbor told me the other day he's been finding dead birds in his yard. Um, this is Tony's from Gloucester. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't. So we talked about this a few minutes ago. The highly bird flu is the highly pathogenic avian influenza that is most, it affects waterfowl and poultry. It's been in geese and gulls and, and ducks and sandpipers and things. She's saying she finds uh, sparrows and morning doves. Are they? No. And so, so no, that's probably not bird flu. Um, if there's a lot of it, you know, one here and there is not gonna, gonna raise any red flags, but if people are seeing a lot of dead birds, there's a, a mass wildlife has a place. If you Google, you know, mass, mass wildlife, dead bird reporting or something like that, there is a place that maybe we can find it and put it in the chat at some point, but there is a place to report you know, dead bird events, and, and they're on alert right now because of bird flu, and they're mostly looking for waterfowl and these other things. Bird flu affects raptors. Um, it affects terns, and we're very concerned it will get into the big tern colonies where there's 30, on Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge in Chatham, think of 34,000 common terns shoulder to shoulder, and the epidemiology of that, or I guess not epidemiology, the zoo demiology whatever yeah uh, but the, the, you imagine a disease just like ripping through that colony and so they seem to have dodged it this year but we're worried about it coming back next year it's been hitting seabird colonies really hard in certain places gannets in europe and others and turns in europe turns in on the great lakes so we're sort of running between the raindrops right now with bird flu here on cape cod but with house sparrows and morning doves it, it's probably not what it is um but again, report it if it's something where you're seeing more than, you know, two or three. Okay. And we just actually in the link uh, in the chat have a link to uh, where you can report uh, wild uh, dead birds that you find. So click on that and check that out. <clears throat> um, Kent has a question here. He says, when walking, some birds move their heads back and forth with each step and some birds do not. If a neck brace were placed on a rock pigeon who moves the head when walking, would that bird be able to walk? 
question. It's just like, you know, this is like Monty Python. It's like, what, you know, what is the airspeed of an unladen yeah, swallow? Unladen. African or European? Yes, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so so <laughs> if you put a, a, a neck brace on a pigeon, could it walk? This is, this is a great question. I want to know the answer. I want to do, do that study and publish it. Okay. There's a journal. What is it? Uh, what is it called? There's a journal for silly research. Um, I don't think it's silly at all. I think no. I mean, this it's, this gets to like there's a there's a um, sort of that that motion has a purpose, right? It's like it's a it's a balance thing, right? I'm imagining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, could you walk if somebody pinned your arms to your side? Yes, but it would look weird. Like I think they'd be able to walk, but they would just have a weird gait. You know, they'd be kind of like it was shuffling awkwardly. It would just th throw off your flow, you know, your swagger. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's, it's, it's part of their, it's, it's just part of their. Yeah. Thing. I want you to do that research and then tell me about it. All right. We'll, we'll get to work designing pigeon neck braces right now. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that is all we have time for. We had an hour here and the market, there's like just so many great questions. We could, we could go all day and just keep going. And, and I know yeah, full of me wonderful too. answers. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, but Journal if people of do have more questions for you, it's worth noting two things. Uh, number one, that you are uh, weekly uh, doing the the uh, the weekly bird report, but then also there's a call in that you do uh, pretty regularly as well in WCAI, and people can call in there, right? Yes, yeah, the second Tuesday of every month, we at nine o'clock on the point on WCAI, we do a, a live call in show about birds. You you know, stump the chump. And um, same thing, just like this, but but you know, live on the air, and mm -hmm. uh, I'll answer your bird questions there too. And the other thing, again, is if you would like to go out with Mark in the field and meet some birds in person, if you give, uh, you make a donation now to GBH in the link that they provided, uh, you can have a chance to do that. Mark, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for doing that, uh, and thank you for all of these these great answers. We really appreciate you being here. Yeah, no, I love it. Happy to do it. Always a ton <laughs> of fun. Thanks. And thank you to everybody out there. Uh, enjoy this beautiful day and a nice weekend. Go spot some birds. And, and thank you for, for being supporters of GBH. Uh, we hope to see you at more events like this soon. Thanks again. Take care.